Welcome everyone. Um, welcome to today's uh, seminar on migration, um, mi uh, Europe migration cities. My name is David Howard. I'm a fellow at Kellogg College and help to organise these series of uh, public seminars, uh, urban knowledge exchange seminars at uh, Kellogg. Uh, we're really keen to bring together members of the public, practitioners, the odd researcher or two, to discuss topical or controversial issues of the day. Um, so I'm very grateful to my colleague Thomas Lacroix, who is a visiting fellow at, uh, at, at Kellogg, uh, but he's really organised today's seminar, um, and more of our speakers later. Uh, but it's a first collaboration between uh, Kellogg, 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 Kellogg College, uh, Maison Pensez Oxford, and Compass, the Centre of Migration Policy and Society. So we're delighted to have a, a triage of speakers and skills uh, here tonight. Um, there are refreshments before and after uh, the seminar, so do indulge yourselves afterwards if you haven't done so beforehand. Um, I'll now hand over the chair for the uh, seminar, the discussion, Sarah Spencer. She is a Senior Fellow and Director of Strategy at Compass, that's the Centre for Migration Policy and Society. Um, Sarah is renowned for her work on uh, irregular migration, integration, human rights and issues of equality. And in 2007 she was awarded a CBE for services to uh, equality and inequality and human rights. So it's a great pleasure to have you here. Sarah is also very connected, as you expect, with many research networks and, and particularly policy uh, focused networks. So delighted to have you here tonight and I'm sure we'll be speaking more of that anon. But over to you, Sarah. David, thank you very much. Good evening, colleagues. I'm glad you didn't say what the CBA stands for <laughs> because when I'm abroad and people ask me what it stands for and I have to say commander of the British Empire, then that's <laughs> exceedingly <laughs> embarrassing. So um, no more should be said about that. Uh, thank you for the introductions. Our topic tonight is migration and cities, but our speakers were actually asked to bring in the word Brexit as well. So I'm sure that with migration and Brexit in uh, one uh, session, we're sure of a controversial and uh, good discussion. As David said, we have Thomas Lacroix, who has organized, brought us together. He is an uh, associate here, but also at Compass, where he's uh, doing research on city networks, uh, and Phoebe Griffith, who is from the think tank IPPR, where, among many other things, well, she's a well-known commentator on migration, but has done work uh, which we were also involved in, in Brexit and cities, and she has some interesting things to say about leadership at local government level, which has emerged during that uh, research. I think it's fair to say that in all the uh, millions of words that have been said about Brexit and migration, cities actually have scarcely been mentioned. They've certainly not been uh, the focus of debate. And yet, uh, certainly at an international level, there's very clear recognition now of the central role that cities do play in relation to migration. And if you think about the Global Compact on Migration, for instance, or the New Urban Agenda, uh, a, a strong call that cities should be round the table when migration policies are made, um, that hasn't been uh, the case, and yet it's quite clear that uh, if we think not only of the impact of migration on urbanisation uh, and economic growth, but also that it's actually at the local level that the impacts of migration are felt, uh, we can see why cities do need to be around the table, and that's something we might like to discuss. Cities have indeed been increasingly over the last decade in Europe developing their own strategies on migration, whether a narrow focus on how do we integrate the migrants within us, or increasingly now a much broader strategy across the city administration, for instance on inclusive growth, where migrants are recognized as simply being part of the broader demographic change that the city has to uh, contend with. Cities have also been thinking about how they can change the narrative about the place of migration within the city and the economic and cultural heritage of migrants within the city. Uh, anyone who goes to Glasgow will not fail to mention that on every pillar you see this uh, slogan. Indeed, you can't go to a conference there without being given a bag, as you can see. And for Glasgow City Administration, people includes migrants, it in includes newcomers. But uh, as I think Phoebe will tell us in relation to Brexit, clearly that sentiment 
is not shared across UK cities and certainly not across all the residents uh, of European uh, cities where the hostility or the perceptions and fears about the impact of migration economically and socially have contributed to the hostility and indeed contributed to the Brexit vote. Many cities are facing challenges in relation to migration they find difficult uh, to meet. Many of, one of the strategies they have now is involvement in networks to talk to each other peer-to-peer, -peer, whether it's the 140 cities in the Intercultural Cities Network or small specialised focused networks like the one in fact we run at campus on undocumented or irregular migrants where cities want to talk to each other about how to handle uh, these issues. They're also increasingly working with non-governmental organisations to address uh, the challenges. And those are all developments in the sort of horizontal multi-level governance of migration which Thomas is organising a seminar with us on later in uh, the year. One of the things the cities are also doing in the network is trying to leapfrog uh, over national governments to address policy at the EU level where they're facing resistance at the national level to doing what they want to do and hope to get a better deal from the EU level. Certainly we're seeing that uh, in our work in relation to irregular migrants mm -hmm. where cities can feel they want to be more inclusive uh, of those migrants than at the national level. Thomas today is going to talk about the way in which national policies impact on one particular city, Calais, its capacity to meet the challenge of migration and the way in which what it does has a ripple effect on <coughs> other municipalities and uh, on residents within the city and how new bordering is emerging within them, uh, between them in relation to their attitudes towards uh, migrants. And then into the mix for Calais and the UK comes Brexit if it happens, um, and a return for UK and France to the reliance on bilateral agreements, which I don't recall worked so well. Um, so one of the questions we might want to discuss is if cities were around the table at national and EU policy, if their views were taken into account uh, in the future of migration policy, would that actually make um, a difference? Marvin Rees, the mayor of Bristol, was recently quoted as saying, if cities have a place at the table when discussing things like migration, you will get a different kind of discussion. The nature of citizenship and belonging in a city is subtly but importantly different than the nature of citizenship and belonging in a country. Do we think that that's actually true? Or is it the case that the limitations of local leadership would mean that if cities were given a voice around the table, they wouldn't use it or they wouldn't use it effectively? Phoebe, I hope, in the contribution you're about to make now, we'll throw some light on that. Phoebe is going to speak first, okay. and then Thomas. I think you've been asked to speak for 10 to 15 yeah. minutes uh, max, uh, really just to lead our discussion this evening, and then we'll make sure we finish by half past six uh, in order to take advantage of the refreshments at Ooh, the back. Okay. So, Phoebe, sunshine. over to you. By all means, use the thing or not. As you I wait. <laughs> Thank you all very much, and thank you, Sarah and Thomas, for having me on such a beautiful day. I'm surprised you're not out there sunbathing and enjoying Oxford at its most glorious. But thank you very much for coming. And um, I've been invited to provoke constructively and not to lecture, um, and maybe to reflect on the work that I've been doing at IPPR. As Sarah said, I've been out there. Um, it, talking to people a lot uh, and since the referendum primarily talking to people who live in leave cities in the UK in leave towns um, so if I'm a little bit less optimistic than my fellow panelists please bear with me but um, I think my maybe my pessimism actually arises less from the people I've spoken to your everyday residents who voted leave in the referendum but as Sarah says more from the leadership of those those uh, cities um, and what we've identified uh, is two kind of dominant patterns of behavior. One is what I call head in the sand. Um, so in cities that we've been to, in towns that we've been to, which A, have seen very dramatic demographic change as a consequence of international migration, often from the European Union, uh, and which also have seen quite a sort of strong outcome in the election to leave uh, the European Union, what one finds is a sort of 
a survival instinct has tended to kick in and uh, leadership has tended to opt for the safe option, I guess. Um, and I'll come back to whether that's a wise option, but um, which is really to stick your head in the, ta in the sand um, uh, and try to change the conversation as, as quickly as you possibly can. I think there's another pattern of behavior uh, and that's maybe on cities which have maybe been uh, through the process of demographic change for a bit longer, and wh which is the bubble mentality. Um, certainly many cities, as Sarah mentioned, have put in place some form of strategy. But when you read these strategies, these are very much designed to talk to your friends, I think. And uh, what I've identified is definitely a sort of certain group of people who often is in leadership positions in local uh, government who are often quite shocked by what they hear. Um, mm -hmm. I had one conversation with someone where I fed back from a particularly challenging focus group with people who worked in the service economy. I, I won't name what's the city. Uh, where I sort of reflected on some quotes, you know, verbatim quotes, and uh, the reaction uh, really stuck with me, which is, was, that's not my city. <laughs> um, and I guess I, I'm sympathetic, uh, but the views were actually quite sensible. I mean, the views that were being expressed weren't necessarily xenophobic or racist. They were views about uh, the state of the local economy and concerns that the influx of uh, very motivated often, and there was a recognition of that, migrants, could have had a, an impact on local wages. Uh, to me, that was an issue that the local authority should have engaged with quite actively. Uh, and in, in fact, there have been local uh, authorities and local leaders who have. Uh, in, in Derby, for example, where there was a big uh, concern around uh, the practices of Sports Direct, a big employer of EU workers who was undercutting and involved in all sorts of uh, challenging behavior around its employment strat uh, practices local leadership did engage and in fact uh, the feedback we've had is that actually by having that conversation uh, mm. they unlocked uh, a much more constructive context in which to think about immigration locally. So those are my concerns I guess uh, when thinking about cities as the sort of uh, as the drivers of uh, a more if you will constructive agenda around immigration but uh, as I said at the beginning um, I think I am quite sympathetic and I and sort of understand the barriers. I mean, the most obvious one is a political barrier. Uh, if you have the option not to engage on immigration, because ultimately it's not your responsibility, why would you? Particularly if, for example, you are a Labour council who on the one hand has to deal with a very radical sort of momentum branch, and on the other hand has to deal with a potential sort of uh, Eurosceptic incumbent. I mean, why would you want to open up that conversation? Um, I think you can do it, you can do it constructively. Uh, Buckingham Dagenham, for example, a, a council that some of you will have heard of in relation to some very challenging circumstances in relation to the BNP, um, have actually undergone a real sea change in the way that they communicate with uh, local residents. They're engaging, and I think that's the key point. They're not trying to persuade, uh, and what they've done is try to understand much more why residents are concerned, try to communicate on the basis of the values that the residents might hold rather than try and out gun them on the statistics or try to, um, I guess, yeah, bring them on board on the basis that uh, the information is wrong. That's not to say that information is not important and that's my second key point. Uh, what's really striking is the fact that lots of the local authorities we have been to uh, tend to be stabbing in the dark. And it's interesting how you know, um, my team of two young researchers tended to know a lot more about the local demographics and recent immigration uh, trends than people who were uh, responsible for designing primary school places in, you know, in the city in, West Mid in the West Midlands or thinking about uh, the local housing stock. So that's quite striking. We've sort of cities have very much fallen behind on, 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 on trying to understand what the flow is. And more importantly, they've also fallen behind, I think, in trying to understand how people are thinking and feeling about uh, population change and more generally uh, the impact it's having on their communities. I think there's a couple of more points uh, which relate to this. The second point is agency. Uh, you know, the UK is the most centralized nation uh, in the developed world, one of, anyway. Um, and uh, our immigration system is the most centralized aspect of our policy making uh, uh, at this point. Um, 
Now, uh, there's an interesting tension there. Uh, my view is that if we were to bring cities round the table to discuss immigration policy, they would uh, assume responsibility and potentially think about immigration in a much more strategic, uh, you know, incorporate it into wider city plans and do all those <coughs> great things that Sarah thinks cities should be doing. Uh, the key point is that they're not asking for that responsibility, and that's one of those the things that we really struggled with when we've been, you know, we've been key proponents for more devolution in the immigration system. The only people who are asking more devolution for the immigration in the immigration system are the SNP, <laughs> and the, the motivations are quite varied and I think largely political. So, I mean, I don't think even Bristol would want to be charged with that uh, with that task because, in a sense, that puts you in the hot seat. Final point is obviously a financial point. Um, you know, we are in the difficult sort of point in local authority finances that clearly plays an important role. How can you justify investing in integration when uh, you know, social services are being cut uh, to, to, the, the sort of to the bone? But I think it goes a little bit further than that. And maybe this is something to think about collectively when we start talking about the way forward is how do you actually capture the benefits for migration locally? I think what we find is that people can perceive the impacts, the pressures very, very, very directly. You know, they will talk to you about the fact that more children with uh, English language needs will join the classroom and they feel that the teacher's not coping or they will talk to you about the A&E department that seems to be struggling with the fact that Lots of people coming from Eastern Europe don't understand the GP primary health uh, system and therefore go to A&E and overwhelm the whole thing. Meanwhile, when you try and talk about the benefits of immigration, those are very diffuse. You, know, you get into conversations about skills and uh, contribution and these things don't really feel very localized. So one thing that I'm very keen to think about is how you can actually capture more of that. And part of it is about government you know, devolving more money. Uh, the immigration system is currently, uh, I would say, very lucrative. All the fees have spiraled. Naturalization fee is very, um, you know, it's gone up fivefold within the space of a decade. Uh, there's big pressures on the immigration system, not least dealing with the settlement uh, scheme. But nevertheless, I think some kind of element of devolution that reflects levels of immigration to different parts of the country could be part of the solution. I personally also think that uh, the key beneficiaries, which would tend to be local, particularly universities, given that I'm here, should actually also um, find ways of reinvesting some of those benefits. Uh, you know, particularly universities who do recruit internationally, uh, very actively, you know, indirectly, that could have an impact on, for example, rental. Um, and this is something that people perceive very directly. Not, I don't know, by in Oxford, but in other university cities where I've done research, people perceive that a lot of those. Um, those advantages, those fees, those people are actually being, sort of those advantages are being captured by universities rather than shared with the wider community. So I think there, there is space for reflection in, 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 in the higher education sector around those questions. So those are just some ideas and some reflections. Um, there I say, I think lo local leadership is critical. Uh, I think in all the places where I sort of perceived a real change, it has come down to people taking responsibility, doing what Martin is doing is in Bristol. But in order to unlock that, I do think we need to think about the sort of the wider public policy sort of framework in which local leaders are operating and how that might be acting as a barrier to unlocking that kind of leadership. Thank Phoebe, you. thank you. Uh, it immediately makes me wonder who the public hold responsible for when they see what they think are negative impacts, do they hold central government responsible? And is it, are you suggesting that that's one of the reasons why local government leaders want to keep their head down? If they're not being held responsible, then they don't want to give any suggestion that they are. Who do the public blame? Well, I think before the referendum, people were holding the European Union responsible, yeah. to be honest, because that was why people were coming. Um, uh, and therefore, we were, you know, and, and, I, and there was a very widespread spread um, sentiment uh, in some of the sort of focus grouping we did was that we were, you know, the bargain with the European Union wasn't fair because whilst people come here, we don't go there, therefore there's a sort of, so yeah, I think the, the, the responsibility was squarely on the European Union then. I think now that the focus has shifted to central government much more because of the, yeah, 
of, of, of austerity and I think the fatigue around austerity in a sort of generalized sense that services are now a breaking point. So I think there, there has been a shift uh, and I think local authorities probably aren't being held responsible as much. Thank you. Well, we'll come back. Everybody will have yeah. questions. But <coughs> Thomas, let's turn to you. Right. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, I would like to start with the second point about the tension between the migration policy as it's been a centralized policy uh, and even a European policy and, and a, as a tension with their local effects. Because I think it's really at the core what, of what produced the situation in Calais. Mm. Uh, the, uh, and Calais in itself actually became a border city with the Schengen Agreement with, uh, in 95, uh, when the Schengen, uh, Calais became, at, well, was situated at the border, uh, external border of, of Europe, because the, uh, uh, the UK was obviously not in the Schengen, uh, Schengen zone. And as you know, Schengen is not only about the freedom of circulation within the zone, but it's also uh, about the, uh, the externalization of uh, border control at the, uh, at the, um, at the, at the edge of, of the uh, European of, of Schengen. And, and Calais became uh, a border city. And from, from 95 uh, onward, uh, Calais um, undergone this uh, arrival of, of, of transit migrants, which were more and more stuck at, at the border. And it was, it was a very difficult uh, situation because these, po these people were poor, they were vulnerable. At that time, it was, they were more coming from the, uh, the, the Balkan area. And also people who were obviously also traumatized by, by the migration experience. Uh, and so the, uh, the first, they, so, so Calais, in a way, uh, to, to my argument, it has been a laboratory uh, in which the, uh, the governments and the, uh, the European authorities have tested different models, different means to deal with this kind of situation, which, uh, which is now much more widespread, uh, which we can uh, uh, observe uh, in different parts of Europe, this, this, uh, similar situations. But Calais is really at the forefront, has been a, pi a pioneer city in this, uh, in this case. And, and the, the, first, the first move uh, uh, was to create this, uh, this camp of Sangat in 98, so one of the first camps uh, gathering migrants in 98. At the, uh, and the idea was really to, 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 to remove the, uh, the migrants from the city center and to, to gather them uh, at the, uh, at the, um, in the suburb in the, of, of Calais. And uh, um, the, uh, the, this camp, well, the first camp was closed in 2002 by uh, the, the, uh, the, the new Ministry of Interior at that moment, which was uh, Nicolas Sarkozy. And uh, he started a new form of policy, much more uh, aggressive uh, uh, policy, which was, I would qualify, of search and deport policy. So uh, trying to prevent any formation of informal settlements, any squat, any, anything within or at the, at the edge of the city, and to deport them in other camps in the, uh, on the French ter territory. So uh, uh, it, it was an, uh, another, another, another policy which was uh, implemented. And, and these two policies really localized the controls. They, uh, it localized the, uh, the stakes of the, the migration po uh, policies. And, and the, of course, the, the local authorities became more and more involved in this process. Uh, and they, uh, there are two turning points. The, uh, one, the first turning point is 2003 with the two key agreements, which formalized the, the arrangement between France and the UK. And they agreed to, uh, uh, to transfer the, 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 the border control on the other side of the, of the, uh, of the, of the channel. So the British control were in France and the French controls were uh, done in, in the UK. And so it somehow reinforced this, uh, this uh, situation of blockage in, uh, for, for the, the migrants. Uh, and the, uh, another, uh, another step into this uh, localization of, of uh, migration controls was taken in 2008 when the mayor changed. And at that time it was, for 30 years, Calais was a communist city. <coughs> and in, t in uh, 2008, the majority changed and Natasha Bouchard became the new mayor. She's still there and she's uh, from the right wing. And, and she really endorsed and, uh, uh, and um, supported 
the Nicola Sarkozy approach. Huh? The, so and, and she really engaged with the local population to, in order to identify the squads, to identify the, 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 uh, the places where, the, the, uh, the locations where the migrants were gathering in order to expel them and to deport them uh, uh, further away. Um, so the, the, this, this involvement of the, the, the municipality also relied on local groups, on the local communities, on the neighbor, neighboring associations who were willing to take part of this process. And also it, it really divided the city. Mm -hmm. Because on the other hand, you had also people who refused the situation. Also, the, the, the volunteer sector also uh, uh, picked up and, uh, uh, and really uh, and also, the, you also had activists coming from other parts of, of France, or including uh, other part of the other side of the channel. So the, 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 the very, there was a, because of this involvement and the localization of the migration controls, the, the local situation became very polarized. Right? In a, in a way. So it, 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 and also, the, this further involvement, also, they also involved the, the, the private sector as well, uh, asking, for example, to to uh, the drivers of the trucks and the transportation companies uh, to, uh, to control their own trucks in order to make sure that would, the, uh, the migrants would not be on board. And so <laughs> the, you, you can see now drivers cannot stop, cannot uh, have any break, any pause uh, in, a, in a range of 100 kilometers of, uh, around Calais. They, uh, so, uh, there, there are a lot of pr different procedures and uh, rules that, that have been implemented, including in the, uh, on, the, on the boats themselves. So it's really, the, this localization pr process is really multifaceted. And uh, well, and I, I tend to believe that as I said, the, this, uh, this procedure, this, uh, this uh, pattern became a kind of laboratory, a test, which after that, was kind of uh, spread all over Europe. Huh? And the same kind of situation and the same kind of uh, strategy of search and deport is, is also implemented in Italy, in Greece, uh, in, uh, in, in, in other border zones. Well, I, I'm, I can't say that it has been invented there, right? but uh, obviously, g given the time frame and the chronology, we can see that uh, something happened in, uh, in, in Calais. Right? which is a really a pioneer city in that, in that, in that, in that stage. So what, what about Brexit? And we say, we heard, uh, for example, uh, uh, Macron during the campaign of the, uh, the referendum saying uh, that, okay, if uh, the, uh, if, if the UK remo removes mm. and uh, leaves uh, the, uh, the, uh, the European Union, we will we, we be able to uh, uh, cancel the 2K agreements mm and to, uh, uh, to uh, um, have these the migrants move away to, to the uh, other shore of the channel. Obviously, it did not happen, uh, but it's not only that it happened. It's, it's the, actually, Macron reinforced the situation, they reinforced the, the, uh, the Tukai agreement, and they, they uh, extended the this, this same policy with, for example, Bernard Cazeneuve and Theresa May, who, who passed an agreement, and Cazeneuve agreed to control, after Brexit, 100% of the trucks that would cross the channel, 100%. And in exchange, uh, Theresa May uh, gave, I don't remember how many millions of, uh, of, uh, of pounds, to extend the fence along the motorway uh, between the, uh, going to the harbor of, of Calais. So this, uh, this policy is actually reinforced it's, uh, it's now, and Kaznov also uh, implemented this search and deport policy in other parts of the, of, the, uh, of, the, um, of the territory, of the French territory, and scat scat trying to scatter the, the migrants after the, the jungle of Calais uh, all, over the, uh, all over the territory. So I would say that, in a way, uh, the challenge for cities are, uh, are still there. But still, there is something which has changed recently. And this, this strategy, this approach, has been endorsed by Calais. But you also have other cities in the neighborhood, of, in the same area, like Grand Sainte, like uh, Laurent Font, they, who, cities who refused to implement this and to try to promote another approach. So Grand Sainte is the first uh, city uh, who 
agreed to create and to set up a camp with the HCR standards. And well, uh, during the, uh, in, in 2015, during the peak of the presence of immigrants in this uh, area. And this, uh, this camp, the Camp de Linière, uh, I'm sure you heard about it. Uh, well, it, it was there for, for two years. So it was a kind of opposite and counter camp to the, the, the Calais model. That he wanted to, to implement, and Laurent Font also, also was uh, at the forefront of this movement of trying to, to promote alternative approach since the, the 2003, since the closure of uh, of the Sangat uh, uh, camp, and uh, and the, the uh, one one of the reasons for for this uh, for that is that the, the, the this search and deport policy had ripple effects on the other cities because they had to. To, to, to receive the, 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 the migrants who are expelled from the, uh, and deported from, the, the, uh, from, from Cali. So, uh, and, and now the Laurent Font and Grand Sainte have uh, decided, uh, also uh, initiated the creation of a city network, which is now called the Association Nationale des Villes et Territoires Accueillants, which gathers cities from all over France uh, with the idea to propose an, uh, an alternative to the, the, uh, the central migration policy. So, uh, and you can see exactly the same uh, process, the same uh, model uh, in Italy, in Greece, mm -hmm. with you got uh, alternative uh, networks of cities. So I think it is one of the way in which the cities are much more now involved, not only on integration issue, but on migration policy issue. There has been a local turn in integration policies, but now there is a local turn in migration policies as well. Thank you, Thomas. You said, uh, and you made clear, that the cities very much have been brought by the government in an expectation they will implement the arrangements. Do they feel put upon by that, or did they feel part of the decision? Were they round the table? Oh, no, no, not at all, no, not at all, no, no, no. So they were just expected to deal with it? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Well, the, um, the, the, the person in charge of implementing the, uh, the national policy at the local level is the prefet. So the representative of the state at the, at the local level. So uh, the, the, the relationship between the prefet and the, the mayor varies a lot according to the municipality. It can be extremely confrontational like in the Grand Sainte case, but uh, it can be also very uh, uh, complementary in the Cali case. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. so we're actually seeing a division there that we're not mm. really seeing in the UK, where from what you said, actually none of them really want to put their head above the parapet and uh, take an alternative approach. Yeah, and you, and, and, and you mentioned Italy and Greece, but in the US, I mean, yeah, there's been yeah. plenty of examples of, of yeah. cities that have gone rogue and, mm. you know, uh, set up their own their own policies. And I'm, I'm generally surprised. Um, I mean, you've had instances in London where, you know, the mayor has kind of expressed disagreement, but there hasn't been a sort of, you know, a, an in, a sort of thought out kind of, we're going to do it differently here. Um, and I, 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 I wonder when or why not um, <laughs> certainly in contrast to places like the Netherlands but then possibly so not so much in somewhere like Sweden but anyway yeah. one of many questions we could discuss so mm -hmm. can I open it out to comments questions contributions David um, well Phoebe you mentioned that um, highlighting the advantages of immigration are difficult at a local level because of the more more versus less easy to give examples, and mm -hmm. I guess one of the critiques of the Remain campaign was not to highlight the positive um, contribution to the EU. So I wonder, what, how would you highlight the positive aspects of immigration at the urban level, and, and what specific sort of things would you highlight, given the fact you said it's quite difficult? I mean, how would you move on from the current state of... Yeah, I mean, there, there's, I mean, there's a simple approach, which would be to go down the we need the workers route, um, and we tested that, um, and uh, people are responsive to that, particularly since Brexit, because I think the, the sense that key employers are gonna struggle now has actually permeated. Uh, but to me, that doesn't really go far enough. I mean, my ideal scenario would be to set out 
uh, a big vision and to start articulating how immigration almost as a sort of subsection mm -hmm. will play into uh, that big vision. So uh, in a city, for example, where there's a big drive to build more housing, affordable housing, how does immigration play into that? I mean, one thing that people don't understand and I struggle to explain is why if we're building more houses because there's pressure on the housing uh, system, are we doing that by attracting foreign workers who then come and live in those houses? So people are answering the logic. So I think you just need to play that out much more, you know, explain that much more. Um, I mean, other cities, um, I think, uh, are, are being a bit more ambitious and sort of trying to portray, you know, the sort of Glasgow style, you know, this is who we are. Um, I worry that that plays very well with some audiences and less well with audi other audiences and, and could even risk uh, alienating those that just want mm -hmm. to get to the nuts and bolts of can I afford the rent and is my school struggling or not. So, so that's my only concern um, about those sorts of strategies. But I think the key point is that you have to get into your, into your community and really understand what, what's driving those concerns and build the, build the narrative uh, around that rather than what tends to be the case is, you know, our, our leader or our new mayor has a vision and we're going to try and persuade you to come on board. And mm -hmm. I think that that's probably mistaken um, and could backfire. Isn't it also a case, though, that there are certain people who are not going to be persuaded by facts and figures, that even if the, the facts yes. on the labour market and on housing and so on are, you know, even if they were unequivocal, which I'm yeah, here, yeah. Is, that for some people this is such an emotional and identity issue yeah. that that you need this kind of approach yeah, in order to yeah. make them, to help lead that kind of thing. And these cultural heritage, let's face it, we've always had migration. Look at the contribution in the past. Is that? I, I, I've, I've not tested that one. Um, I've, um, I mean, I was working with a city that was wanted to be city of culture. Uh, it wasn't successful. Uh, and they were trying to embed the conversation around immigration and there was very little of it into the notion that they'd been outward looking and a seafaring kind of uh, city and that immigration would sort of play into that identity. And we tested that a little bit um, and people were responsive. What they were more responsive to was the city is gonna actually work really hard to bring migrants who are gonna invest, who are gonna generate jobs. You know. so, so I think it, ha it has to be both at least, yes. um, not one or the other. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Other contributions on this or other points? Yes, please. Again, uh, one for Phoebe. Why do you think the focus has always been so much on the EU when immigration has always been higher from outside of the EU and remains higher? Why isn't it neck to neck now? I think, I think it's pretty much neck and neck in terms of the EU, but historically, I agree. Um, I think that's quite a recent development. I mean, Sarah has been working on this for a long time, but certainly when I started working on immigration around 2002, mm -hmm. the focus was very much on you know immigration from the sort of Indian subcontinent primarily, um, and uh, I think it's a reflection of how immigration flows have changed. I mean, uh, yes, overall non-EU migration and EU <coughs> migration are comparative, but the sense that you know the statistics give you is that where you've seen big growth has been from from the EU and particular countries of the EU. So I think that sort of reflects, w well, that, that's one uh, explanation. I mean, the other point, and as much as I think some people try and really sort of disaggregate the two, people don't necessarily um, distinguish in, in, in their lived experience. And, uh, and it's certainly you know, attribute all sorts of stereotypes to different types of migrants, but nevertheless, it's the sort of overall sense that more people are speaking languages that I don't understand, uh, and uh, I struggle to kind of uh, really navigate their cultural practices, whether it's, I don't know, uh, being a practicing Muslim or whether it's drinking on the street. It's, it's that sort of generalized sense that there's change around me rather than, yeah. oh, look, there's more EU migrants in. Um, mm -hmm. than there used to be, or whatever. I think it's true to say that we failed to anticipate, I mean, there was a collective failure to anticipate that there would be the level of hostility to EU mm -hmm. migration that has mm -hmm. emerged. 
And I wonder if it isn't partly because of the hostility to the EU and the fact that the two come mm. together, mm. Um, and that there is with the EU something to blame. It's not mm. so clear who we blame. Yeah. And that notion of control, I think, also mm. plays yeah. into this, mm. uh, and the fact that you know people perceive rightly that coming to the UK from outside mm. the EU is subject to you know a whole set of controls mm. that don't um, mm. don't apply to coming from the EU mm. um, and for all it's worth I mean I think the the focus on you know making people aware of control being paramount of you know the paramount control uh, concern of immigration policy has fed into mm. how people might perceive mm. immigration from outside the EU um, how does this play in France who gets blamed and gets blamed uh, well the discussion so far is really really around uh, the Islam, the place of Islam in the public sphere. Um, well, we are still in the aftermath of the, uh, the, the debates uh, around the scarf, mm -hmm. uh, I would say. The, um, well, and the, the, uh, the refugee crisis, uh, with, uh, it uh, hasn't changed that. It's, uh, it's really, it always rotates about uh, the, the people coming from the south. But uh, to to, um, to to add something to to, what your, to your question, uh, I remember the presentation of a cognitive psychologist who asked you a panel of, of uh, British people to portray a migrant, and the uh, the response they were portraying people with uh, with white skin, with blue eyes, and with uh, blonde hair. Uh, and I think it's uh, there has been a shift in the early 2000s in the stereotype of who a migrant was. And maybe this shift has not been taken into account by the policymakers. I mean, it has been something which yeah, has been. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. Robbie? Um, I think I'm not straying too far off the city's point, but I think it might be helpful to bring in those cases of these smaller villages in Calabria and Spain and mm -hmm. elsewhere where uh, migrants have been seen as a solution to mm -hmm. um, declining populations and to collapsing small villages, you know, no school, or the school can, has to be shut, no post office, no mm -hmm. local stores. Mm -hmm. And so local mayors in quite a number of villages in Colombia and elsewhere have encouraged migration. And it, of course, in, in Italy, Mario Salvini has actually confronted yeah. this very personally and very directly. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. But you can see that it's like the moral loading it, is very much on the side of the the mayors who are taking this positive <coughs> step, and that's how the debate has been framed. But if we generalise that point just a little bit more, and this is to pick up really Phoebe's and um, slightly you know difficult task of trying to weigh the positive effects of immigration, mm -hmm. uh, I think perhaps this is the reason why the Scots are reasonably productive have a benign view of that is they are depopulated. Mm -hmm. you know, in a country that is struggling to maintain its, its population, there are quite a number of areas and zones in Britain and elsewhere where we're losing population. And so at least one of the arguments I think we should have is, and goodness knows you've had this argument so many times in different segments, but trying to redistribute problems away from, or issues, or features away from London and the South East towards places where a different dynamic operates. Mm -hmm. And it strikes me that there's at least some degree of purchase in that argument that we can find places, small cities, villages, and so on, which will be welcoming mm -hmm. to climate. Mm -hmm. And we're still too focused on the big cities where the obvious problems of incomers uh, are well known to us. Yeah, at the European level, you're at the, um, so the case you're referring to in Calabria is Rianche, mm -hmm. which has been a kind of uh, iconic uh, example. But uh, there has been cases of villages in Spain. They started in the 90s building up a mosque in the village in order to attract people from Morocco and to settle in the in providing them <coughs> services, the services and and trying to attract families. That was the, 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 the 
set one set of. It's interesting to see how they uh, you get a range of actually immigration policies, local. Uh, well, I wouldn't call policies, but measures who had been taken by uh, by local authorities around Europe. Uh, the <coughs> the um, in the 90s, uh, they tried to also, Germany uh, has been at the forefront of that, to attract uh, people with the same ethnic background, the, this German ethnic from the Russia, uh, and the uh, Spain uh, tried to do the same with the, 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 uh, the, descent, the descendant of uh, Spanish people from Argentina and so on, so giving them the nationality. So there has been a few attempts like that. And, uh, <coughs> so, but now it, it has disappeared from the, 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 the agenda, uh, as far as I know. Uh, and that's right, uh, he, uh, and the, the mayor of Rialche now is in prison. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Which doesn't help. Which doesn't help with uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think one of the points speaks to yours about how do you demonstrate the benefit. Because I think in those small villages, all the villagers know what the benefit is because they're suffering from the depopulation. Mm -hmm. They can experience it. There's nobody to pick the crops and so on. Is that the difference that yeah. in, in areas even where there might be a benefit from migration, it's difficult for the public actually to see it in the way? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm really um, interested in those examples. And, and we did sort of embark on one piece of work in Sunderland uh, to test out where they could be for the, the future. <coughs> in Ohio, is who the, the, the sort of city that we had in mind, you know, post-industrial city that sort of reinvented it as a kind of a new Ellis Island of Ohio and all that. And we thought, wow, this is perfect. Um, and uh, we talked to a lot of uh, residents and um, there was a, as a conditional uh, level of support, conditional on uh, not replicating what Middlesbrough, not far from Sunderland, had done, which was in effect admit a lot of asylum seekers in exchange for uh, funding from central government. And that's what they, they saw as the kind of the problem, because obviously asylum seekers are dependent, they're not allowed to work, uh, and uh, it had caused quite a lot of uh, problems in the community. However, a strategy whereby you were actively attracting entrepreneurs, and I don't think that necessarily means IT and tech people and students, but actually entrepreneurial people who will, you know, take the boards off the shut up shops on the high street and, you know, em embark on something that's about growth and, and uh, attracting investment. That was very, I mean, that resonated very actively. I guess it's sort of, I mean, my, my experience of the local leadership, however, suggested that that was very, very far down the line as, uh, on the list of priorities um, and if possible avoided at all costs. So, so I, yeah, I think it does come down to sort of people willing to risk a bit of political capital around these things and, you know, uh, and going in, into it from that perspective. But, I mean, suddenly it could have, it, it, it's something that you could see happening in a place which has run out of options, which Sunderland sort of had got to that point, you know, it's, it's one of those places where you could sort of see, yeah, if you articulated it in a way that really spoke to local concerns, it, 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 it was a possible strategy. Hence your leadership. Bit, I hope there's no one from Sutherland, but, <laughs> but people were talking to us about it in those terms, you know, the, the city needs something new and we were, you know, we're prepared to take risks, you know, that we've been at this for too long and you sort of thought, well, could this be one way of approaching it? I mean, the other question is whether or not, and this is where we get picked up on these things a lot, is whether or not by doing that you attract people but they don't stay. And yeah, that's yeah, one of the that's things that, you know, I don't know how they manage it in Spain mm -hmm. or in, in, or in Italy, but yeah. the sort of, the expectation is that people will use those avenues as they have in Canada to, to move back the big metropolises um, and, and I don't know whether that's been an element of what's happened in Italy but it, it would be interesting to, to understand that. Thomas made the point about networks and cities increasingly getting together to voice their shared demands, shared views on what they want and to learn from each other. Again, not something we're seeing very much in the UK. You're the one who's trying to. Um, <laughs> We are working yes. uh, with cities. That's very much shared learning. I don't yeah. think it's in any way got to the point where they want to have a common voice to speak mm. to government. 
I mean, government is trying to orchestrate a bit of that. Um, so they've mm. got something called the Controlling Migration Fund, uh, and that's very much about, it's almost a grant-making uh, scheme, uh, and part of that process is about getting cities to share and to talk to each other much more. Um, and they've got their five integration areas, and again, part of that is also to try and build up knowledge. Mm. Um, but it's interesting that it's come from central government. Uh, mm. It's not mm. actually coming from cities uh, themselves. And um, yeah, and there are plenty of networks that exist. But immigration, I mean, we, we've mm. tried to engage on immigration with a number of those networks, like the LGA, the Local Government Association, yeah. and others. Not, not really what they want to engage mm. with. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. Britain is different. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 No, that's true. Really, you, you got. Um, Few networks I mentioned the Andita, the uh, Recosol in the in Italy, uh, who emerged uh, spontaneously in reaction to migration policy. But you also have already established associations. Uh, you mentioned the LGA in, in the UK, which has not been really active in the in mm -hmm. migration issues, but uh, the uh, its Dutch counterpart has been much more active. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and of course at the European level, we also have. Uh, Euro cities yeah. uh, uh, who had formed a working group on migration integration, and uh, and you also have working groups in the uh, the Council of European Municipalities. Uh, so you you have a range of uh, of possibilities for these cities uh, and places that where they can discuss about not only integration but also migration mm -hmm. policies. You mentioned the Dutch Association, which of course recently secured an unprecedented agreement with the national government that the cities are able to provide shelter and services and legal mm -hmm. advice to migrants with irregular status, which is mm -hmm. the first across Europe. So what is it about Dutch cities mm -hmm. that enables them to network so effectively together? It's another centralized country. On the other hand, the cities actually are rather powerful in practice and are able mm -hmm almost brought the coalition government down a couple of years ago on that issue and now have secured agreements. So there must be something here about the place of cities within the national governments. Yeah. So the, the Dutch uh, local government associations is one of the oldest of the world. Mm -hmm. So they have a long history of uh, independence and uh, organiza collective organization. Yeah. Thomas. I want to ask about the role of native mobility for the non-migrants, or you know, in the case of the UK, the UK born people. Uh, so if you have a large migrant influential community, uh, the locals there, you know, the, the, the people that were before that inflow, uh, many of them are going to leave uh, to other to other cities and to other uh, areas of the of the of the city. Um, and this has two implications. First, the people that you're talking to when you go to these places. In some sense, are stays. So those are the ones who stay, even after the migrant inflow. So it's a very selected community, and I think that makes a difference on how you convince these people, because they are not particularly representative of the group that was there before uh, the arrival of the migrants. And then the second thing is when you think about taxation and how and this station has been uh, uh, commented on. Uh, the migrants are great because they have a good fiscal impact, so at the national level they contribute, but at the local level we have to provide them with services and that money might not flow, might not, might not flow back. But if you have native mobility also, it means that the, that impact of migration is not really concentrated only there. So by the fact that migrants came in, then some locals left to other locations, to other local authorities, or maybe to other places around the dream city and might create pressures there that are really inv invisible uh, for us. Because there are, no, there are no migrants there, but the natives have moved there, so you can have a rearrangement of the native population, and that will have implications about how you use taxation to minimize any negative effects of migration. Carlos, are you talking about flight because of migration, or just these are the mobile people? This is flight because of migration. Okay. Mm. Okay. Which one of you wants to start? Yeah, well, you, you get ambivalent effect of this uh, native migration mobility because also the native uh, leaving the area can also be uh, older people uh, and 
and uh, actually you can find in I think it's in your study <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, find uh, these na neighborhoods where you get uh, an influx of immigrants, whereas there is a lesser pressure on on uh, on uh, public services uh, because the, 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 the new uh, the newcomers are younger, they require less uh, health uh, health care, less uh, I don't know child care. Uh, so yeah. So also you get the NIMBY effect in the Cali, uh, what, that's, uh, what happens, uh, uh, locals uh, organizing in order to, to voice their concern about the, the newcomers and the immigrants. And so the press lobbied the, the municipality into taking action against the immigrants. Yeah, I mean, just on the sort of mobility of people, um, I mean, I think I'm, I'm very, struck by um i mean the fact that there is um there seems to be two groups and it's almost irrespective of whether or not they're migrants and they're people who move and they're people who don't move <laughs> um and certainly the people that we talk to tend to be the settlers the people who you know for whatever reason don't choose to up sticks and i don't think it's often about migration it's sort of generally know why are you here if you don't like it kind of thing you have, I've asked some people and and they just don't think that's an option um, uh, so I think that definitely plays into attitudes you know if you are in that class of person the person that doesn't pursue a, um, a opportunity and doesn't actually sort of look uh, to the future and you know the things that migrants tend to do because they've you know done it um, then you probably are more resentful I guess if there's a lot of change about you so yeah I agree with that that, that as a bias in terms of who we talk to. However, I do think that group, no one was talking to them for a long time. So uh, in a sense, we, we did try to sort of maybe calibrate a bit more by actually going into places where there would be things. Sadly, I mean, but a lot of the people that voted leave as well that we were talking to in the last program of research, I mean, they were people working in professional jobs um, and who were moving around, not necessarily internationally, but certainly not, they weren't people who were sort of you know, white working class people don't ever leave the area. These were professionals as well. So I think it's a mixture of, of both of those categories. Yeah. 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 Uh, I have a question for Thomas. Uh, you kept talking about the laboratory, the laboratory of uh, Pele and the counter experiments of the other cities. And I was wondering how, how did these cities actually check the effects of their policies on the population? Were the actual surveys carried out perhaps to see how the population reacted to um, or was it simply they, they don't really test it they, it's really a reactive measures mm -hmm. taken uh, in front of a situation so, um, so we got migrants in our streets what shall we do okay let's open a camp even if we don't really want to, to open a camp let's do it that's what happened in, in, in a for the second camp, uh, the, the, the jungle, the, uh, the, uh, uh, and the and and then they they uh, dismantled the camps. Uh, the migrants were back to the city center, uh, and then they had to to reorganize the the, the, the presence of the police forces. But it's, everything is really so reactive, and uh, mm -hmm. there is no not really any long term plan uh, for the management of uh, the, these people. And so there was no survey, for example, on how the population. Well, the uh, Natasha Boucha was re-elected. <laughs> this wasn't a conscious experiment, and you weren't suggesting that the government said, "Let's choose Calais as an experiment." You're saying that, in a sense, this is what, in effect, happened. Yeah. That it was a pilot, but it wasn't set no. up as one, so it no. wasn't no. set up for having anything measured. No. Maybe it's the only uh, the only experiment was the uh, the uh, UNHCR camp in Grand Saint. That's what they tried to do, and it worked for a few months, and then uh, there was a fire which broke out and uh, and uh, destroyed the camp. Uh, so that was the end of the uh, of this experiment. But it was a real experiment, in the sense that the camp was organized. Uh, they all, uh, physically by uh, according to HCR standards, but also it was an experiment of governance between the uh, the city, the municipality, and the local associations, mm -hmm. 
because this camp was run by associations, not by the, the municipal services. And, and they, they set up rounds of uh, regular meetings uh, to monitor how it went. And so this was, in that sense, an experiment. Yeah. But this, this is only one. Hi. Um, can I ask, is there a more historical sort of analysis or research of these phenomena that's been going on? I mean, in a way, when you're talking about your local groups, they're already in the situation of a, of a, of a, of a Brexit scenario and similarly in Calais. And uh, uh, I'm Irish, so I kind of see it with a much longer perspective, both in the sense of Irish um, and uh, as the diaspora, but also as um, Arthur in North America, um, the most um, you know, anti-immigration group you could come across, actually. Um, and I think these smaller or different or more historical perspectives mm -hmm. might help add uh, dimensions to this. And I was wondering if there's research being done on that that's then informing the actual current situation that you're talking about through analyzing what's going on at the moment. Um, you've got, <coughs> based on the, um, the movement of European movement going to the, to the US, you've got historical studies about um, the, the, the policies which were implemented by sending states to, for, the, uh, for reaching out their, their diasporas, but also how they could deal with, for example, um, private companies, how the, uh, especially the transportation companies, the, the boats, the, uh, um, in order for them to, 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 to pressure the, these private companies to, to improve their standards and the, 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 the conditions on board. So to protect the, uh, the Italians were good at that. The uh, Italians, uh, the Italian governments, uh, they uh, passed different laws in order to, to, to improve the, the living conditions on board. Uh, for the passengers, so you can you can find in the historical uh, examples of uh, different modes of governance between the public and the private sector. Uh, that, uh, uh, but at that time, it was not that much the uh, relationships and the, the collaborations between border controls companies, private companies, and states. It was more about the transportation companies. Yeah. Please. Can you don't to rely on any historical. Studies there was, that were helpful. Well, uh, there was an oral history study, I remember, before the referendum. I think it was a couple of academics here at Oxford. And that was very interesting because they went to quite, uh, you know, quite white working class estates and talked to people about their trajectories uh, and found that whilst they wouldn't have migrated in from outside the UK, a lot of them had a sort of history of mobility mm -hmm. and had migrated from Scotland or, or Ireland. So. And they use that as a basis of a conversation about attitudes to migration from outside the UK. And I thought that was a really interesting way of, of sort of actually bringing people's personal histories into their current attitudes, if that's what you were going for. But there has been a, a real industry in immigration museums and trying to kind of, you know, uh, I think France was the pioneer. <laughs> oh, I guess in the, in, the, in the US you've got the other. Yeah. But you, you, yeah, so, so setting up and you've got a sort of equivalent in London and suddenly to the east end of London now has a kind of whole sort of yeah narrative around the sort of almost archaeological levels of immigration <laughs> and, uh, and you know the kind of retrofitting of endless buildings that have been you know everything from mosque to you know, to synagogue and everything in between so so and I think those are interesting conversations um, to have uh, I wonder whether that co that sort of argument that we are an immigration country, actually, people are persuaded by. I I I haven't tested I it. I suppose I don't think it, it's it's so much the argument as the as the understanding there was a time when it would be no Irish or dogs in the yes, um, yeah. uh, in, yeah. in London in a, in, oh, yeah. in, a, in a place they had come and stay, and uh, and that's changed, and that's changed yeah. partly because of the widening perspectives that have, have happened. Maybe it's because they're targeting other people and things, mm. but there's a psychology yes. that has changed, mm. and, and psychologies do change. 
Mm. It's actually strange. Yeah. I'm just wondering whether there's anything around that that's, that, that's maybe informing the policy directions that are mm. developing. Mm. That it, I've come across a study about the importance of the memory of migration and the, uh, how it affects the perception of, of uh, immigrant, immigrants. And there is a comparison between free neighborhoods in London and they found that the neighborhoods who really perceive themselves as immigration, with an immigration history, uh, are much more likely to have a positive attitude mm -hmm. to our, towards my newcomer. There's a much broader acceptance. And maybe there's something of that in Ireland's history, in that as a country of emigration with so much experience of emigration and how migrants were treated, perhaps this is part where Ireland has a more benign public opinion towards immigrants because of that experience? Yes, I think you have it in, in the country. It's, yes. it's when they go to other countries they seem to forget about it quite a bit. <laughs> so that's where that psychology can, can come in um, quite, quite emphatically. Changing what shape of it seems to be something that's not quite understood. Thank you. Before we close, I mm. feel we ought to pick up the gauntlet you threw down about universities. Oh, yes, please. Um, <laughs> so you suggested that I was hoping. we mm. ought to be doing more, that we benefit hugely from international migration in our staff and yeah. our students. Yeah. What are we giving back, essentially, you said? Effectively, if that's not um, too a challenge but um yeah certainly there is a complacency i don't know about oxford but uh, two of the cities i've i've been working in are university cities um very active on this issue uh, uh particularly the universities at national level um you know really on they, there they do join a network you know the universities uk network have been sort of very actively advocating rightly so uh, around all the rules uh, applied to international students and the impact that that's having uh, on them. But I'm always struck by the sense of entitlement around that conversation because it's on the basis that without those international students we won't be getting fees. Um, and I'm not sure that's um, entirely consistent with the notion of universities as public institutions. That sort of, and, and I think a little bit of pushback on that from government um, could go a long way. I mean, we've played with the idea of, well, that, that there is something called the Trusted Sponsor Scheme, um, which is about enforcement of immigration rules. So you, you have to qualify that as a university, and Oxford, I'm sure, does incredibly well. Uh, other universities have been in trouble about the fact that students haven't necessarily um, complied with the ter their terms of their visas. But why not expand the definition of a trusted sponsor a bit more, uh, and within that include the expectation that, uh, for example, I mean, this, this is a very tiny example. You also offer free ESOL classes to the migrant population in your lo local city that uh, <coughs> might be struggling to learn English because ESOL budgets have been cut. Uh, and maybe, you know, put in place some kind of mechanism that is about giving back um, and not an expectation that uh, just because we are growing as a university, everyone benefits. Because I don't think, you know, your average resident probably perceives it in the same way. I, I'm not sure that he is right statistically because if you look at many of the cities that have tried to attract university people like, like Worcester or Lincoln and so on, they do so on the basis that there is an enormous boost to the local economy in the institution there. And it's not true that the universities only benefit because many of them don't have sufficient uh, accommodation anyway. So you get a huge boost to the landlady's income all over these little places, not to mention spending power of the students, um, which generates quite a big boost to the local income. There's just been a re recent report by the UK, um, um, Jonathan will know the uh, exact name, but it's association of various universities which are, um, have, have tried to cost us mm. city by city. And um, yeah. universities don't do badly. No, no, and I'm persuaded by the fact that overall a city does very well out of um, having a university that's successful recruiting from China and Nigeria and, um, and that those students bring with them spending power and overall that has to be good. Uh, I won't name the university, but I was very struck by the attitude, uh, one attitude, which was 
we have to cater for those students because otherwise they won't come. So we have to provide the best uh, infrastructure. We have to really have the sort of top quality uh, Wi-Fi connection for the students. And when challenged on this point, their point was, yes, and we will reinvest that in the further education college, which they referred to as the no-frills version of the university. Now, if I were a local parent uh, who was witnessing this sort of binary system whereby international students from China were being offered you know, global standard education. Meanwhile, my kid, local kid, was being offered the no frills sort of, ep yeah, I don't know, um, easy jet version, um, and the other guys were in the nice BA sort of first class. I would be resentful, to be honest. So I think the expectation being there that some of this should be very explicitly, you know, corralled into some kind of community investment fund that is very much about you know, we are going to play our part in the local community uh, and pay attention to the fact that the local park is looking pretty scruffy, to be honest, and, you know, that kind of stuff that people really care about is, is worth thinking about. <laughs> what other things? <laughs> Should the university do more? Could it? Are there things we could offer, like ESOL, was your suggestion? Well, that's an easy one, I would have thought, because, you know, you've got language labs, right? <laughs> and English tutors, I don't know. I mean, that's okay, so I'm, I'm going to sort of row yes. back one small <laughs> Take the University of Warwick, yes. which I know very well in Coventry. Yes. Okay, Kuma Bhattacharya, um, who is now a late uh, professor of engineering here, more or less um, created... Um, uh, Land Rover, Jaguar, Ford, Tata, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, for you know, hundreds or people, if not thousands. The university has a ten million pound program bringing local students yeah. on scholarships and so on. All the facilities of the university, mm -hmm. race tracks and so on, are shared with local. So there are huge numbers of examples. Mm -hmm. I, I think you're not uh, aware of extent to which is yeah really and I and I mean I'm doing it from the perspective of people who voted in a certain way in some of those cities uh, and the fact that there's no perception of it suggests that it has to be done made more visible potentially um, I was very struck when we started working with the six cities UK cities in our network of, of the knowledge exchange when we started at the beginning and we said to them, in relation to newcomers to the city, who are your greatest assets yeah. in terms of that you work with? You know, who's going to help you the most? Without exception, they said NGOs. Mm -hmm. And we're thinking business, employers, mm -hmm. universities, mm -hmm. arts organizations, sports, or, you know, the, the mm -hmm. people who actually have the capacity to make a difference in terms of be people feeling included. Universities, they just were not mentioned as mm -hmm. part of the uh, array of organisations locally that could make a contribution. So it may be that the contribution mm. you're mentioning, well, it isn't to integration because it's to economic yeah. wealth, they would be aware of that, but whether universities, among other institutional players, could play a greater role yeah. in actually uh, building strong relationships between newcomers and local people? What would be I mean, part of your argument? Uh, uh, yeah. Certainly employers, I think, uh, need to be Probably prioritize over universities. Um, I chose the universities given the context, but I mean, I think employers, there is a perception that have been given a free ride in relation to free movement, um, and that uh, is something that needs to be looked at quite carefully in certain sectors. I mean, the one sector that we talked to people a lot about was the dis logistics and distribution, which tended to be often located outside cities where lots of employers seem to be relying on agencies who recruited internationally. And there was a sort of sense that that wasn't necessarily a level playing field for local workers and left employers off the hook. You know, employers who used to have to sweat quite hard to get local adolescents sort of work ready and you know, deal with their bad work ethic and sort of you know, their lack of skills now could just recruit a 26 year old Polish guy who was gonna turn up. <laughs> so there was a sort of sense that there needed to be a bit more more look, look at in that sense. Mm -hmm. Creepy. <laughs> thank you. We put you on the spot, so thank yes, you. Yes, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> a last yeah. word from you? Well, the um, absence of uh, businesses uh, at the local level, you can also find it in the conversation around migration and immigration policies and so on. 
at the at the at the regional or, or global level. Uh, it's the early in this uh, global compact and the, the architecture of this new governance of migration, you get uh, the states, you get the cities, you get the NGOs, but you get you do, you do, not, do not have the businesses. Huh? Whereas the uh, internationalization of, of the job market is is one of the main factors uh, shaping the the, uh, the, the, the the migration uh, around the world. Huh? So so here we get we get uh, we get a challenge huh? this, this, to establish this conversation with, with them. Um, yeah, that's uh, that's my point. Yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> thank you, Thomas. Thank you both. Uh, very very interesting discussion. Um, let's give them a round of applause.